All right, so this week is over security and databases. You guys can fake woo again if you want. But, yeah. All right, so eventually when you get to your application, you realize, like, how do you save data, right? Nothing can be just like a string or a variable all the time. So it's got to go somewhere. And you can't just post it in some little text file because then nobody else has access to it. So if you actually want to make this content available to everyone where any phone can connect or any web app can connect, whatever you want to do, there's databases, specifically SQL which uh, th there's several different kinds, right? There's the Microsoft SQL that you probably heard of, which are what the IT guys do, like OIT here anyways. Uh, all the stuff for big systems, like all the Windows networks or whatever, go to Microsoft SQL. There's MySQL, which has to do more with web-related stuff. PHP uses it um, pretty much. Uh, I think ASP actually uses it. it. It's the website of SQL anyways. There's SQLite, which is what Android actually uses. This one's used for a local database on your phone so or, or on your computer. So uh, one thing you might know is HTML5 actually does a thing where you can save. They also use SQLite. Uh, your phone, Android, uses SQLite. Uh, iPhone actually uses something a little bit different, um, but it's it's really similar. It's, it's a SQL type of system. Next we have PostgreSQL. This is for more of Node.js or Ruby apps. Uh, pretty much the same as MySQL, just a little bit different syntax and not as old. And then finally there's NoSQL, which is what we use a lot in here. There's things like po uh, Parse and Firebase, which actually lets you like put in a key value command and you instantly send it to the server. There's no like select all from database where thing equals what. It's just... Um, row.users equals blank dot commit and then it just fires up to the server which is always pretty cool if you're making like a quick app, quick application for one of your classes or something like that you can go with that but SQL basics it stands for structured query language um, it's sorted by tables rows and columns so you have a database and let's say you have a table for users you have a table for uh, classes that this user takes and you have a a uh, table for contact information. Then finally, each one of these has rows and columns. Columns is where you keep track of like your ID, your name, your email, different data types. And finally, rows is each thing of data, right? So each person would make a new row. And we'll get onto that later. So the syntax anyways, you can select from a row, you can see and and or, so you want to select users where uh, ID equals blank and username equals blank. Uh, you can order this data by ascending or descending. You can insert into the database, update the database, create and delete. So let's talk about relational databases. So a lot of up to juniors don't even know about this and it's a big like interview question to a lot of people, but basically how do you make a database that references multiple tables without wasting data? So I can't make a table called students and a table called courses and put name for each one because what if the name changes? Like this guy's randomly name changes, I guess, or whatever. Uh, you would have to go through every single table and change it all and there's no way to reference it and it's just a bad system. So instead we use IDs and we can actually reference that ID. So I have two databases here, or two tables, sorry. One's called student and has my student ID, my name, and my email. And I use Kevin. Uh, then I have courses, so each ID. So like I have 1310, uh, which is under the CSC department. It has a name and it has the hours. Notice you don't see the section, you don't see the teacher, or anything like that. That's for the next slide. So this is the, the full list of courses, right? Once again, it has an ID, but it's not necessarily referenced as a course number. So you have the course ID, which references back as you see courses. So 15, uh, 568, you see that again, and we have section number. So you'll see it's listed twice. You have section 001, section 002, and then you have a teacher ID. Same exact thing. If a teacher changes his information, you can fire directly, find the teacher ID, and associate it to which. Same with student enrollment. If I want to enroll to a course, I reference, well, I get an ID so that can be referenced again. I have my student ID, which references my name and my email. I have a course ID, and then I have a term ID saying like spring semester, fall semester, and whatnot. It sounds kind of complicated, but you, you just got to think about it as like, uh, we associate people based off their name, right? Uh, nothing really changes other than their name. Like, I, I know uh, their height might change. I, I don't really keep track of people's height, but if I know their height change, I just reference like in my head, like, oh, James grew an inch. And so that's stored in my local database in my brain. But anyway, security-wise, uh, so there's these things called uh, secure socket layers and then HTTPS. If you've ever noticed on your browser, you have the green little lock or that message that pops up saying that this page is not safe. 
Uh, that's where you get this kind of stuff. So normally back when the internet was created anyways, uh, people were really insecure. It was only meant to do like basic research things like send data. There was no JavaScript. There was no real databases. It was just online content. So there's no need for an encryption connection between the two. So now you have SSL. Uh, pretty much anything that requires authentication or a username or sens any sensitive data, not even sensitive, any data whatsoever uh, through a request pretty much needs to be secure now. So it sends encrypted packets to the web server essentially. So how does it do this? So there's, there's two, th two ways that uh, a server kind of connects to a computer anyways, a browser, uh, or it kind of keeps information about that user. So sometimes you may get to a website and it'll be like, do you agree with our cookie laws or whatever, uh, or a session law. Um, not really much of those, but cookies, basically what they do is it's a variable that sticks on your browser based off your um, based off your uh, like the, the address you're going to like let's say I'm going to Google and it wants to store a cookie into my browser well it, it knows that this browser is me by a unique token and you can actually set an expiration date so unlike sessions sessions is kind of a one-time connection right so let's say I want to log this user in by keeping track of his uh, user ID or maybe on the next page he loads uh, since I can't actually send data that way, I can say the next time he loads it, uh, maybe show a change log of what happened on the server. And so that'll only happen once. So sessions, they expire as soon as you close a browser. Cookies, they expire whenever you want them to. You can set a date to be a year, three years, a day. It's up to you. It's usually used whenever you click the memory log. Remember me login. Uh, important thing to note about cookies is that the flag you can set is that it can only be accessed via HTTP. Oh, really? And not via JavaScript. Uh, oh yeah, okay. So that someone could just put like a SQL injection and grab your cookie and start acting like you. Gotcha. Uh, isn't that like an Apache default thing though? Or is it, if you've messed with the configuration files? I just know I have to look for it. Gotcha. I don't know how to actually make it happen. Uh, well, I know there, there is like similar functions in uh, PHP anyways. <laughs> Uh, you can actually set things to do with uh, how it's, it's getting requests. Like you can make, uh, one thing I'll talk about later is a post and get request. You can make it to where only that domain associated with it can make requests to the server. And same kind of thing for cookies. So make sure you watch out. That's another security thing. People can hijack sessions and people can hijack cookies. But you just got to be smart when you make these things. So how about hashing and encryption? I'm, I'm sure you've heard of this term before, but not really sure of what it does. So types of hashing, there's things called checksums, there's non-cryptic, and then there's cryptic. So one easy way to say hashing is you see, hello, uh, H is given the ID of 8, E is 5, LL are both 12, and O is 15. This adds together to be 52. So that's, that's a basic hashing. But how do you get these crazy ridiculous numbers like MD5 or MD6, the, the picture you see at the bottom there, uh, how that kind of works is it, it's a sequence of math anyways. Uh, it adds different things. Nobody really knows how they work except for the people who made them or the people who are cracking them. Uh, they get outdated really uh, relatively quickly anyways. Uh, HTML, uh, what's it called, um, MD2 was a few years ago, like a long time ago, and now they're up to MD, uh, MD6. Every year they make it more and more secure as well as being able to optimize it. So you think of adding all these numbers together to equal 52 really easily, right? But what if you take all these numbers that are crazy big, uh, you do some square rooting, you divide it by some number, it gets pretty crazy, so they, they get pretty difficult to ha uh, they get pretty difficult to crack anyways. So in terms of encryption, uh, it uses kind of the same thing as hashing, except it does in two different ways. There's one called symmetric cryptography and then asymmetric. So let's say, uh, I, I'm sure you've heard of like the World War II, whenever they were sending cryptic messages to each other, what they did was called symmetric cryptography. So basically they had some key which they pushed into a uh, file or a data type or just a text message, not text message because that didn't exist, but a message and it was able to alter the text which they could then use that key to alter back. So if you look at it, this hello kind of thing, this is symmetric. This is, it can easily be changed uh, using that same key which is adding them all back together uh, relative to what letter it is in the alphabet. So uh, a lot of people use this a long time ago, nobody really uses it anymore. Uh, now you have something called asymmetric cryptography, which uses a public key and a private key. Banks actually use this. So every bank you, you uh, associate yourself with, whenever you submit data from your credit card or your bank account number, you have this extremely long digit number called a public key. 
And what they do is, think of it this way. So uh, every bank gives somebody a box, right? And you can put some stuff in the box, but they don't give you the key. So you can only lock this box. You can, uh, you can put stuff into it, but you can never take it out. The only way to take it out is if you have their private key, which only the bank has. So if I want to uh, encrypt something in a certain way where uh, no one else can see it except for the people I'm trying to get to the other side, uh, they would need that other side of the key. So this comes in handy because on a symmetric key anyways, both people have to know that public key. And if that gets out, then the encryption is broken. Uh, private key uh, anyways is uh, this person doesn't have to be like, hey, this is my private key. They keep it forever. Um, it, it's pretty interesting. Uh, I mean, I, they have classes at UTA about it that get even more detailed into it. But just the concept of it. What's up? What is symmetric then? You gotta, you gotta symmetric is just like one password, like having a Wi-Fi password. It's the same thing everyone knows. Here. But asymmetric means there's a public and private key pair that it requires for the encryption uh, data to be exchanged. Cool. Well, yeah, like I said, there's a class about it, and it's. <laughs> it, I haven't taken it. I just know the basics. I about it too. Whatever. Get out. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so in terms of user authentication, right, so this kind of has to do with the hashing and encryption and whatnot, but how to do it, how not to do it. So the absolutely horrific way to store a password is plain text. I mean, look at on the side way, I guess, uh, if you use ResNet and you ask them to send you your password, they will send it to you in plain text. Yeah, they'll send it to you in plain text. So the, obviously, they never encrypted anything because you can't unencrypt something like that. Whenever you MD5 it, like there's really, unless you crack the MD5, which is crazy impossible. Well, I mean, some people have done it, but uh, it's pretty much you're, you're not going to, anyways. So in this little table, they're storing whatever my password is. And most of the time, people store the same password. Like I, people use the same banking password as they do their Twitter, as they do their Instagram. So you find one password, you find them all. So what's the slightly less horrific way, but still horrific? So uh, you just apply one single hash to it, usually MD5, usually SHA1. And so the problem is here, uh, if someone has the same password as someone else, it's going to show up as the same key. Adobe actually had this problem like a few years ago, like 2009 anyways, where they stored a password hint, and they also stored the, the hashed password, and only hashed. So that means the 123 uh, hash several times is going to be the same thing. So you see here two people. Some dude's password hint is the opposite of East, a little logical operator. Another, another's is myself, so his name's Yeezus, so obviously the password's Kanye. And so now I have access to two different accounts just by knowing the same MD5 password. So that's absolutely awful. Don't do it that way. Finally, we have the good way. So what this does is, let's say I'm sending to a server what a password would be. So first of all, I want to hash that password once just to send it in. Once that password is retrieved, if I'm creating a user, it's going to do something called salt. It's going to make some random string of characters, and it's going to append it on that hash password, where it then can rehash it into something completely different. So I see they're using the same password, Kanye or whatever, right? This guy has this salt, right? So it takes that password, it encrypts it to be MD5. It takes this salt and it just appends it somewhere on the string. Obviously, it's going to keep track of it. Some people put it to the end. Some people put it to the middle. Some people put it uh, to the very beginning. And then it re-encrypts it. And so it's com something completely different. So how do you check if a user is actually logged in? Well, we do the same process. And if that hash matches the hash in the database, then they're good to go. They can log in. So uh, you can do it that way, but the absolute best way to do it is just let somebody else do it. It's easier, it's cheaper, and it has a better experience. So basically, log in with Facebook, log in with Twitter, log in with Google. It, it's easier, just do it that way. Um, and if you lose somebody's password, it's Facebook's fault, not yours. So what about the dangers of the internet or really anything? So you have three main things. One's SQL injection, another's cross-site scripting, and the big one is cross-site request forgery. Uh, there's this little little comic strip. I'm sure you've seen that. What's up? Cross script. Cross side. Oh man. Cross site request forgery. Cross site request forgery. Cross site request forgery is what we're talking about. Anyways. That's three for him, one for me. All right. So what about SQL injection? 
All right, so this one is has to do with SQL. So I mentioned how you actually select from a database. Select all from users where ID equals whatever and password equals whatever. That's where we log a user in. But what happens if we don't, what's called, sanitize this data? Well, there's comments just like there is in HTML, just like there is in Python, JavaScript, C. You can make co comments in SQL just to keep track of what you're doing. Most people don't comment SQL unless they're hacking something, but that's what SQL injection does. So you see here, they're selecting all from the users, but what if they force a comment out of it? So instead of typing the user ID or the username, they end uh, what's called escaping that variable, right? Uh, they say or 1 equals 1, which is obviously going to be true, which then allows them to log in with whatever. And you can see the script that that makes. Select all from users where 1 equals 1. So now they have access to every single user on the database just because they didn't sanitize their data. So one way you can prevent this is you can strip tags. Like uh, if I were to enter in a user ID strong, whatever his name is, in strong tag, if I ever loaded this up on my page, his name would be in bold because I didn't sanitize it. Another way is remove entities, right? So uh, what's called, like, if you do a double quote or a single quote, you can actually turn these into the ASCII values so it won't mess with anything. And finally, filter the data in general. Uh, so if you're going through a email, obviously you don't need uh, random tildes and all of that. You just need an at sign, a dash, an underscore, and an exclamation mark maybe. And also one, two, three, or ABC. So this one's cross-site scripting. Uh, it's kind of like SQL injection, but it actually uses JavaScript to do its uh, dirty deeds anyways. So let's say in the top of a URL, I say whatever the URL is, and then I would have the name of the user, and he's going to appear on the page. So what I can do is I enter this little script at the top, and it's actually forcing the script tag to happen because it's being directly embedded into the HTML. Uh, so you see this H3 tag, right? It's getting whatever the request name is, whether it's a variable or from the database, and it's calling the name to it. So just like uh, SQL injection or removing the entities or the tags, if I were to say that bold tag there, his name would be bold. Or if I were to do something more malicious, like let's say escape whatever the HTML tag is, like I see input placeholder. If I were to say double quote and then run some malicious script, it would go through and I would have whatever I want from that user. So it's like SQL injection, except maybe a little more harmful to the specific user and it uses JavaScript to do it. So cross-site request forgery, this one's a really big one. Um, so there's two ways really that an HTTP or hypertext transfer protocol sends to you, right? There's a get request and there's a post. A get request is whenever it retrieves the data remotely. You can do this more than once. A post request sends or creates data. So let's say a post to a form, it's going to make a post request and it's only going to do it once. A get request, on the other hand, if you look at YouTube, uh, usually they have slash watch v equals whatever the name is. They have a protocol of HTTPS, they have a uh, domain of YouTube, slash watch is the page, and v equals whatever is the thing that loads the video. So if that v equals uh, whatever is changed to something else, it can load an entirely different video. So one example of this is some crappy bank goes and makes a form that allows you to enter someone else's account number and transfer them money. Now how they do this is all you do is slash transfer, uh, whatever the request is, like the destination and the amount. Since you're already authenticated, it's not asking you for your specific account number, which is already a flaw. So let's say I enter this information and I hit submit. That transfers to somebody else's bank account. Now, what happens if I'm on some forum website or some random website anyways that has the same thing but it pushes a comment to the page once I hit submit. Okay, let's say I enter a comment on YouTube, right? I'm like, this video is awesome, cats for the win, and I hit enter. It could have this thing like hidden fields embedded into it that have that account number they want transferred to and an amount. So not only is it making a post request to the comment form, but it's also making a post request to your bank account. And if you're already logged in on that browser, well, you just transfer them however much you, money you wanted to. Uh, now with modern browsers, uh, modern uh, JavaScript, jQuery, Ajax, all that kind of stuff, you can actually make a post request as soon as the pa person enters the page. You don't have to submit any buttons. Uh, it just kind of happens. There's a lot of protection against this, but there's ways to get around it. So some random dude hacking, because that's what hacking is. You run around in a trench coat and press random buttons on computers and printers.
Um, other examples, so I'm sure you've seen this before, uh, random people comment to you on Facebook or Twitter getting you to go to this website. Uh, well, what happened was they went to some website that was already authenticated with Twitter and now it's posting on their page without them realizing it. Uh, now, it can either choose to do the same thing to me if I went to this website or maybe it's got scripts embedded into it. So if I have this crappy greatbank.com, it's going to go and make those post requests. Uh, same thing for deleting someone's account. All right. So let's say uh, you go to some website, like let's say you're on Instagram or whatever, and you go to conf delete your account. Well, first of all, it goes to confirm delete first. And then it goes to delete once you hit confirm. Because you're never going to hit delete first, right? It's going to assume that you're going to go through confirm delete and then go to it. But what happens if you're already logged in and some malicious website sends you to slash delete? Well, you're gone and all your cat pictures are too. So how to stop it? Uh, you, what you can do, uh, a popular way, is generate a form token every time the page loads. So what I mean by this is, like I said, the input that's hidden, uh, every time the page refreshes, no matter what, every different person, it randomizes and makes some random hash that's going to generate. It stores this into the user's uh, session to only stay once, and so the next page they go to, it sends the session data. So let's say uh, I go to the page and the parameter of token matches the one I have inside my session, then I allow it. But let's say some random third-party website is trying to ask it, uh, access it. Well, they don't have access to my session, uh, session data, which is, I mean, they can, which is really hard to do. But uh, most of the time, this works, and it's a really secure way to stop people from posting on your form uh, without uh, getting the authentication to. So how this looks, this is a PHP script that I wrote for a specific thing. Uh, it generates that MD5 key and puts it inside of your token. Uh, yeah, underscore token name and then it checks it All right, so uh, you have the generate function and the check function so the check function then sees what you have inside of your session and matches it to what it just got out of the parameter as you can see there so let's look at the HTML side of it it looks a little bit weird because I was using twig and blade uh, if his hiss was here he'd probably throw up but yes twig uh, so obviously I generated that value of input token and then as soon as that goes through it'll check to make sure it matches and let me to do whatever I want and so this one is James. So um, with all that information that he's yes. Yeah. Uh, well, the CRS protection will completely negate it if you have any cross site scripting that's happening on the page. And you what? can easily grab your session, so you have to kind of watch out. Right. For that. Right. And then that that's another that's another one that was listed. You have to watch out. For. I know, but. Uh, even if you have all that CMR protection, you can still get screwed over if you do right. cross-site scripting. Yeah. And like, so, well, one important thing I wanted to mention was that a lot of these, these invulnerabilities exist, and also at the same time, a lot of frameworks exist to prevent, your, to, to prevent these kind of vulnerabilities. So, if you, um, if you just, you know, if you're building an application and, and you want to secure your application from these kind of things, you just, just I recommend using Google and looking up framework to, you know, prevent these kind of things or something like that. Um, that's going to be your best friend. Uh, so a little bit about how to structure your web app. So um, let's see, I don't have a. Let's see if I have a, uh, a marker. So uh, I'm going to draw, draw a little diagram real quick to show you kind of how um, how to think about this. So um, when you're, whenever you think about a web application, um, what can, what parts on a large scale exist? Anyone have any inputs? Like, uh, if you could categorize a web, a web app into like three parts, what would the three parts be? Or name one of them. Um, front end, back end, and something in the middle, hopefully. Yeah, so that, that's pretty good. So, so you have your front end, oh god, and then you have your back end, and then what we call middleware. Okay. So these three categories are pretty much sum up what web applications consist of. Uh, on the front end, uh, you're going to have, you, you, well, you have um, your your web. Oh, this is a really terrible marker. I'm sorry. Um, you have your, your web server, right? So so someone uses a browser to access your website or web server, or whatever, uh, whatever your web app is hosted. I got another one. I think this one works. That one's okay. Um, and so. Your, 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 this is says this is our browser window. That, that's from. Um, and so this browser window accesses the web, web application. So so the browser is a part of the 
it's, at, at this point, a part of the web app, right? You're running the web app through the browser. Uh, so it's, it's a key part to running your web app. And so you, you run your, your web app right here on the browser, and then you access all of your information. Uh, if, if, if you don't go through middleware, you go through, directly to, to the back end, and you have back end code to handle like database requests and things like that. Uh, what a middleware can do is it kind of uh, takes the load off the back end to, to do some uh, more interesting tasks. So let's say we have like a pretty advanced uh, web, web app that maybe it takes data from multiple sources and it like it compiles it uh, or it has to do some, run some kind of algorithm. Um, the, the, we, we would try and do that on a middleware server where, where we're taking that data and kind of uh, aggregate it, you know, run the run the calculations and then push all the middle all the Calculate data to the back end, where, we're, where the back end all has to do is just store and send. So it's just getting and pushing. So like, if you can minimize your back end to do as little as possible, that's better because then your um, then your service can be can be a little bit faster as far as retrieving data. Uh, so your middleware is kind of like the the backbone essentially of your application. If you if you structure it this way, now you can you can put your middleware code on the back end for like a real lightweight application and it works just fine. But it depends on how big your app is and you got to think about these things when you're when you're scaling apps. But uh, an important factor in security to think about is that it's easy for someone to come in here, right in, in between the, your front end and your middleware or your front end and your back end, and do, any, do all kinds of stuff. So let's say I submit a request. So I, I submit a JSON request, and let's say that I, I'm, a, I'm a malicious hacker with a hoodie and I'm on a computer with a bunch of green letters, right? And um, I have a, a, a really neat tool that can, that can take your request and and like filter it, and I, I can read it before it actually gets sent out, and I can modify it, which actually exists. Those those tools exist, and you can modify these requests that are sent. And so, since say that I you know I take off this little link here, and I move this down here, and I make some modifications, and I send it back up. Well, now I've changed what you sent, and I could potentially get access to things that I'm supposed to get access to, or you know give you things you're not supposed to have. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that this this Link here exists, and it's a very insecure link and that we can't solve. We can't ever get rid of this insecurity here. So we have to keep in mind our authentication should exist on the middleware and the back end, and it's even it's, it's even better if it, if it only exists on the back end. That's what people are looking at me for. <laughs> oh, hackertimer.net. <laughs> so um, it, it's better to, to keep your authentication <laughs> on this side and the front end. Um, does everyone see how that, that works? Okay. Um, now, where the middleware server comes in, security-wise, is let's say I have I have Parse, right? And um, if, if anyone's ever used Parse before or something like that, you have a you have like an authentication key, or you have, you have like an application key, and usually you have two different keys you're keeping track of. Now, those are keys you don't want to put on on like front public-facing code, because then someone could just go in there, they could you know view source and get your keys. You know, really easy to do. Um, and anything on the front end is easy to get a hold of. It just takes time. Uh, you know, depending on how deep you, you've gone, but um, any code on the front end should be considered completely insecure and um, just act, just as an access portal. So you would put those keys in the middleware server, where the, where the middleware server would take um, would take in the data you're getting, or, or would give you data, but it would handle all the keys and all the all the sensitive uh, values, and then and then it would handle the transaction between, between the middleware and the back end. So um, the, the, this is a good way of structuring your application, and uh, security-wise, having a middleware server is never a bad idea. Because you can handle those kind of keys. Now, if you have, if you're doing a backend transaction where you don't have to have keys, you, you could possibly, um, you know, deal with direct, directly with the backend. But you have to um, also keep in mind what's sensitive, what's not sensitive. What do I want to be public facing? What do I not want to be public facing? So uh, keep those things in mind whenever you're structuring your app. Any questions about that that stuff? Okay. Um, so I kind of went over this a little bit. So never do authentication checks on the client side. It's a bad idea. You should do what what Cameron mentioned, where where you uh, you you know you hash it and you send it off, and then the once you send it off, then on the back end side you uh, you you, you decrypt it and you're like, okay, what uh, what are we dealing with here? You know, you, then then you're, you're you're dealing with the unencrypted data, um, and it's not it's it's good to hash and salt because then you don't have to. Uh, Worry about you know people who are dehashing. I mean, you, there are always people like the NSA who have these awesome machines that can decrypt anything, but you have to uh, uh, at least protect it against the average hackers who want to you know do malicious things. Um, so let's see what else did I not cover here? Um, <clears throat> yes. Okay. So um, let's, let's think. Can anyone think of an application where you have to where where you have uh, users and certain users have have different um, different views in the application. 
as opposed to other users. So like if they have an admin role, they don't have any ideas. Like a forum. Blackboard. A forum. Yeah, Blackboard. Okay, he mentioned the forum. Uh, Facebook. I think I think we have that. Well, for the pages. pages. Yeah. For the, pages. Okay, for the pages. So those are those are uh, there's a there's a term for it, but basically you have uh, uh, it's it's a, like user roles, right? And certain users you want to be able to see certain content, and some you don't. Um, now. One really easy way to do it is to just make it not visible, right? You can just say, oh, this is not invisible. But then I can just go, you know, open up Chrome, go to developer options, and change that flag to true, and then I can see everything, right? And I can access it all. So uh, there's a couple ways you can handle that kind of thing. One, you can, you can make sure that the user session, that the user has like a token, and only if that token matches the one on the database can it return values that, that they can actually access. So, so even if you make it to where, they, to where you can set true or false to the view, um, you can at least... Um, you can at least make sure that they don't actually have any ability to actually change anything. They can just see it. They can see the portal, but they can't actually do anything. Now, another way to do it that's a little bit harder, but it's actually a really neat way to do it, is to actually serve up. It's a, so you, you keep the, the, uh, like the admin panel on the, on the database or on the middleware server, and whenever that person authenticates, then you actually, you actually return it back with a JSON value, and one, one, of, the, one of the parameters is HTML code, or it's, it's, it's all your... You saw your web code, so you're actually serving up the code, and then you're running it. So that way you can keep track of all who has track of what, um, what views. And those are, are both in, good ways to handle that, but you, it's all up to how you want to do it and how hard it is to do those things. Um, and uh, I mentioned that JavaScript thing. So use JavaScript to, to serve basic views based on authentication and stuff like that. Um, any questions about this? Oh, okay, cool. So. Um, a quick hint is to consider using some pre-made stacks. Um, I, some, some of you might have heard about uh, heard the word stack, um, and that kind of refers to um, how you have your web application built, like how, what you built it up on. So we have like uh, MAMP and LAMP are pretty popular. Um, basically, it's Linux, Apache, MySQL, and uh, you know P for your your uh, logic, which is PHP, Perl, or uh, Python. So, um, and MAMP is just Mac OS X versus Linux. Um, and then the mean stack is really popular nowadays. And um, it actually kind of takes the, stat, the word stack in a different direction. It's not actually talking about like the specific operating system necessarily, but it's talking about the, the frameworks used. So mean is for MongoDB, ExpressJS, AngularJS, and Node.js. So Node.js is your server. So like on here, we have Apache. Instead of Apache, we would use Node. Um, and for Mo MongoDB, it would, would be used instead of MySQL. And ExpressJS would be your uh, would be like your PHP or Perl, and AngularJS is, is used for the front end side. So ExpressJS is for the back end for handling uh, like um, web requests, and then uh, AngularJS is, is for your front end, making it look all pretty stuff like that. Uh, and and this, this kind of stack, the mean stack, is really more of like a uh, when, you, when you think about from back end to front end, and the, the LAMP stack and MAMP stack are really, are really more of like server side, like an, like administrative side. So you think about like what you're building your your application on server-wise, um, all the way up until your your website. But um, both of them are, are really useful, and you can actually have a LAMP stack, um, and you just cut out a few of the parts and, and, and implement a mean stack on top of it. Um, but it's all how you have it set up. And then uh, there's a lot of stacked frameworks out there, like Meteor, Sane, Derby, Sales. There's a like like Mean IO is another one. These are all frameworks out there that exist. You can just implement into your project, and it pretty much has all those. All those different stacks implemented already, and you just install it with one package, and it makes it really easy to, to get set up for the project. Um, and I, I encourage you to look these up and kind of learn about them. Now, um, a, a little word to the wise: these are very like intense to get into. So if you're gonna like pick one to learn, I recommend finding one you like and just kind of learning about how it works because they're very intensive. Because you're basically learning like four different frameworks or four different technologies in one package. Um, so keep that in mind. So I talked talk a little bit about stacks and uh, um, and a little bit about like what a full stack really is. Uh, no, it's not stack stack pancakes or dollar bills, unfortunately, or even the database like the storage type. Um, so what does it mean to be a full stack developer? Um, it means you have to have an open mind to new technologies. You, you're kind of like a um, uh, uh, forward thinker. Uh, you, you have your you have your hands dirty in all the different kinds of technologies. So you so you um, you're not just you know you're not, you're not just over here on the on the client side code. You're also you know you're getting into all all these different technologies here. 
Um, and you have to understand the entire web application. So you have to understand what it means to develop a, an application from the front end all the way to the back end. Um, and then uh, you're evolving every day. So every day when something new comes out or something changes, you're, you're always in the cutting edge. You're understanding how those things work. So um, here's a, a little diagram about what full stack was in like 2000 and what it is today. So in 2000, you have you know the standard stuff, operating system, database, web server, server side code, browser, client side. Nowadays, we've basically added on like two different layers. We have design and embedded development. So um, how many of you have heard the term IoT, Internet of Things? Anyone heard that term? OK, if you haven't heard that term, I recommend going and looking it up. There's probably a Wikipedia page on it. Um, Internet of Things essentially is just having devices that are linked to the internet. So, like you know how they have like the Philips Hue or like the Nest learning thermostat, those kind of things. Those would be considered IoT devices. So, uh, and those are becoming really popular. And uh, it's a kind of a, a world that hasn't been um, tracked down until just recently. You know, just in the past five years, it's really been kind of gaining gaining traction. And within I think within uh, the next five years, it's going to be a twenty billion dollar industry. So, uh, you know, it's really important to kind of keep that in mind, that embed and development is going to become more and more popular. But also keep in mind that, you know, it, an embedded development by itself isn't worth anything if you don't have the internet connect connectivity and you don't, you don't have the database and the web applications to interact with it. So uh, it, takes, it takes the whole stack to make it happen. Um, and that, that's what I'm kind of showing you here. Also design. So uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, they say, oh, I'm a developer, I'm not a designer. Well. Um, sometimes it's good to, to have a little bit of experience with design, at least understanding what good design practices are and good design uh, patterns are. So that way, whenever you go work in industry, you kind of know off the top of your head what, uh, how to take a, like a nice looking design and turn it into something real, or how to how to how to build a nice looking looking app and make it make it something that's useful. Um, so a little bit about so back here, I, I mentioned like uh, some of the different parts, and these are some of the different parts that are kind of looked at nowadays. So if you ever get a, if, if you ever want to consider yourself a full stack developer, these are some things you might want to consider getting familiar with. So system administration. Um, uh, a lot of guys, they, they get a job just doing this alone. And specialization is not, is not a bad thing. You, you can be really good at one thing, and that's, that's cool. But to be a full stack developer, you kind of have to keep everything in mind. And one of them is this. Um, and the picture in the background is like a terrible server room. Uh, I don't know if you can tell. But it's, uh, <laughs> it's like a nightmare for, for anybody who's ever worked with servers. This is like Cat5 cables running everywhere. Um, there's a there's a really cool there's a really nice Reddit uh, sub, uh, subreddit called Cable Porn, and it's awesome. There's like these beautifully lined out cables on all these server farms. It's amazing. Um, so uh, system administration, you know, understanding what Linux is, understanding how, how to make, make basic scripts and shell, and how to use the terminal, um, understanding how how to how to like run background processes, how to um, how to search through files on a on a, on a Linux OS, or how to you know cache things, how to run, how to do caching on a on a server, and these are all important concepts to understand. Uh, and these are some some tools I've listed out here for you. Some web development tools. So, um, and, and these aren't just like web development in the sense of uh, actually writing code, but these are more of like helpful tools in making the web development. Uh, version control. We, we we preach that one all year round is version control. We use Git. Uh, that's our that's the one we use, but some companies use Mercurial and SVN, um, and they're still being used today. So you know, at least having understanding how those things work is important. And then virtualization. Um, this this area really hasn't been approached in web development in a, in a while, uh, but recently, web virtualization has become really popular with with uh, testing out web, web applications interacting with other ones. So you can actually virtualize a server and test and see how it interacts with you without actually having to deploy onto a real server. You know, uh, it's pretty handy. Also, comes in handy for testing vulnerabilities. So if we have a virtualized server and we can test and we, we can uh, uh, you know test if there's any vulnerabilities in it and if we do find one then we can just wipe it and then start start a new one and it doesn't affect any hardware level stuff it's just virtualized so it's easy to you know to manipulate the operating system oh and that's a funny GIF if you didn't get a chance to read or a funny comic if you didn't get a chance to read it this is a USB version control um so uh, back end um. How many of you uh, consider yourselves backend developers? Anyone? You got one backend developer? Okay. Um, and and back, a backend you know developer really has to understand these some of these concepts here and a little bit more. You know, uh, a back uh, someone who's just a backend developer would be would be specialized in this area, and uh, would have a really good understanding of how these things work. 
Um, but it's good to just know, you know, uh, how these things function and what they are. Web servers, you know, you have Apache, Node.js, uh, and we've been talking about this kind of stuff this 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 time around and, and a few lessons before. But if you ha if you haven't heard this thing, of these things before, I recommend going and learning. Um, programming languages: PHP, JavaScript, Ruby. These are backend languages that are really popular with you know web servers. Um, databases. We we went over that today, and understanding that, understanding that in a little deeper uh, sense is important. Oh, and and this uh, picture here is um, an SQL injection on his buffers on his license plate. There was actually a guy who did this and got his information to dis to be displayed on like a billboard, like on those le electronic billboards. Mm -hmm. that he like drove through a, a traffic light and it like showed his information on the billboard. It was really interesting because because they extract the text from the from license plate. So he's like, oh, I bet I could just like write an SQL injection and it would just be sent up to the database. Sure enough, it worked. <laughs> so, you know, cl clever clever hackers, right? Um, it's probably a system administrator. Those, those guys, those, they always have time to do that kind of stuff. Um, so front end, this is where this is what everyone likes to do. How many of you are front end developers? Anyone like to be front end developers? There's usually a lot more front end developers than back end developers because it's more fun, right? You get to like make pretty visuals. You get to do some cool stuff. You get to use Angular JS and you know all these cool new frameworks that are really popular nowadays. Um, and and, and front, front end, you know, to be frank, is probably my one of my favorite ones to do. It's it's, it's you know it's a um, more uh, rewarding, I guess. But um, you know, you have to know some of the some of the frameworks here. You have HTML, HTML5, CSS3, um, understanding like less, SAS, uh, JavaScript, AngularJS, um, jQuery is kind of falling away, but still being used. Um, and then uh, under, understanding responsive design. So like thinking about you know uh, how to resize based on screen size, also like animations and, and uh, different kinds of things like that. User experience. And then um, mobile technologies, which is what we're all about, right? And uh, it's becoming a real big, popular thing. And uh, so understanding iOS, Android, uh, hybrid apps. And I put this this stupid logo that Toyota uses on other cars, hybrid synergy drive. I feel like that's really uh, um, like someone just was like, what can we what can we name this system? Hybrid synergy drive. That that sounds good, right? Um, so hi hybrid apps are really popular nowadays, and I think in the future. Um, we probably won't even be developing with native unless we're like doing game development or we're doing uh, something that's really, exclusive. you know, yeah, something really exclusive or really intensive on the operating system. Um, so hybrid apps will become more and more popular as, as time progresses, and with that, hybrid app frameworks will be better and better. Um, which we're, we we like uh, Ionic; it's it's one of our most used ones, and it's really nice. Uh, and then design. So understanding, I talked talk about this earlier about how important it is to understand what good design is. And to be honest, not everyone is going to have an eye for good design. But at least understanding how to how to take a uh, a design template and turn it into something real is a good is a good uh, skill to have. Um, but if you do have an eye for artistic things, or you, you you think you're an artistic person, you see you know what looks good, what doesn't look good, um, then you know maybe go into like design principles and UI UX design uh, and those are those are really good things to to have um, experience with as well. But um, so last last but not least is not everyone should be a full stack developer. <laughs> this this is a GIF on the right of this this uh, it was a game developer and the news that the news person was asking them, uh, hey, uh, can you just send like like real computery for for the for the video footage? And he's like, yeah, sure, and just like did this on the keyboard, <laughs> um, and they actually aired it, which is hilarious. They put this on <laughs> Anyways, uh, not everyone should be a full stack developer, right? Um, specialization is a good thing, uh, and if, if if that's what you're about, if like say I really like back end development or I really love front front end development, uh, I don't like doing any of the other stuff. That's that's cool, and and those people are needed in industry, so it's not bad to be a full to, to not be a full stack developer. It's okay to be specialized, but you have to be good. So you have to keep in mind that if you're specialized in a certain area, then you need to know all things about that area. You need to you need to really you know be good at a certain thing. Um, where, whereas a full-site developer would be someone that's, I would say, is more on like a managerial type role or, or even um, like a startup. Because startups, you know, uh, they don't really have like roles. They don't have like a, you know, like all the different tiers that a full business would. They actually have just a bunch of people that working together, solving a problem. And sometimes they'd be like, hey, could you go and set, set up that back end for me? And I go like, sure. You know, I, I, although I, this whole year I've been doing nothing but front end, but I'll go pick it up and do that back end for you because it's real fast paced and those startup environments work um, very 
uh, cohesively like that. So um, if you're entrepreneurial, you want to start your own business, or you think you want to work for a startup, then it's uh, you might want to consider being a full stack developer, or at least having some attributes of a full stack developer, so that way you can kind of pick up things or uh, learn things quickly. And that's that's really the key is is understanding how to learn quickly. Uh, if you can, if you can do that, if you can pick up technologies quickly and and uh, easily, you know, start building something, then that's that, that's an excellent skill to have, especially in, in fast paced you know uh, companies. Um, back to specialization a little bit though. Um, not everyone is interested. In, in learning everything that ever, that you are. So if you're if you're like me, I, I consider myself a full stack developer. I'm not I'm not really like a, uh, a specialized person. I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. You know, um, some of you relate to that. Some of you don't. But not everyone is going to like that mentality. Some people are going to be like, well, I don't know why you like that stuff. Uh, and, and it's important to not get into arguments about that because <laughs> that's happened before, at least uh, some of ours. So there's some resources. That, some of the ones I used. Um, I pretty much just copied off the, like the last one there. If you open that website, you see a lot of the points are almost identical to my points. Um, so, um, full disclosure there.